Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist with the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is May 20th, 2021, and I have the pleasure of being here with Angel Garcia. Among many other things, a longtime Bronxide and community organizer, the former executive director of South Bronx People for Change, and the recent author of an excellent book from Fordham University Press, The Kingdom Began in Puerto Rico, Neil Connolly's Priesthood in the South Bronx. So we begin these oral history interviews by asking, why don't you tell us a little bit about your family's background and how you ended up in the Bronx? Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I was born in 1956 in Puerto Rico in a town, the municipality called Cabo Rojo and uh, over in the southwest corner. And uh, we were three of us siblings, three brothers. I was the first, my brother Pedro came in second, and then Eider, or either as we call, call him now, came in third a couple of years later. So we were all about a year and a half apart. By the time, shortly after he was born, after the last brother was born, um, we came to the United States. Um, my parents, uh, my father, also Angel Garcia, um, so for a good while I was known as Junior, mm -hmm. that was the nickname. Um, and my mother, uh, Aida Martinez, and um, both from, uh, from Cabo Rojo, and um, they were, we all sort of came to the United States in 1961 mm -hmm. as part of the uh, Great Puerto Rican Migration, um, which was, you know, had its wave from 1946 to 1964 when you had this large uh, Puerto Rican migration after a couple of smaller ones in, into the U.S. Um, and we came to the Bronx, as did many of the, of the Puerto Ricans of that time. Um, we ended up on a place on Simpson Street and uh, lived there for about, oh, I guess, about a year and a half, maybe maybe a little more. Um, not too far from the train station, not too mm -hmm. far from the precinct that was known, eventually became known as Fort Apache. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I went to uh, PS1. I think it was PS 120 at the time for sort of my first year mm. there and uh, was told my mother at a at a uh, parent teachers conference was told by the teacher both both my parents were fairly bilingual sure uh, which was you know not always so common uh, as they came in into New York City uh, my mother had a high school education um, and in Puerto Rico, and my father had uh, gotten a college degree at the Catholic University in Puerto Rico, in Sagrado Corazón, mm. I think it was. And um, the, uh, so my mom was participating in this parent-teachers conference, and she said, uh, this was according to my mom telling me, she said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Garcia, uh, but I, I just don't think your son is going to make it. And, uh, you know, we had the language problems, right? Yeah. Came straight out. I mean, it was, I was five years old, and then I'm spending the next year in, uh, in first grade. Sure. And uh, it's just sort of navigating things. And uh, my mother kind of heard that, and I guess she kind of said, we'll see about that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, after that, uh, you know, she made sure she was working with me regularly, to um, uh, for me to get up to speed on English mm. and on all of my subjects, um, and uh, the um, uh, and so we had eventually I got around to being able to uh, get through all the subjects and um, you know graduated <laughs> first, graduated that first grade uh, made it okay. And uh, we moved on from there. I think then afterward, uh, maybe we did a little bit of second grade there. I'm not sure. But then eventually, I ended up. Uh, we ended up moving, moving on up, as they say. <laughs> you know, with that uh, TV show, The Jeffersons. 
we moved up to the projects. Mm. Deluxe apartment in the sky. So yeah. we went to the John Adams houses. Um, and this was on Tintin Avenue. Mm. New development. And uh, the New York City Housing Authority. Sort of a seven building development. And what's interesting about it is... Um, it was, that was 1962 when we came in, just about when it was, you know, shortly after it was built and opened for business. But in the middle of this complex of seven buildings, sort of two large blocks, was St. Anselm's Church and St. Anselm's Elementary School. Sure. Right next door to 721 Tintin Avenue. Yeah. That's where we moved to. So we ended up on the 10th floor, and uh, we... Um, we actually didn't start going to school there, or I, I didn't. Um, I went to a couple of blocks over Prospect Avenue to PS 130. Mm. Uh, I think it's called the Hewitt School. Mm. And I was there for, I, I think it might have been for a couple of years. And I, but in the, in the third grade, I was in, uh, I began in this religious education program. With the cath, uh, with the school, the Catholic school next door, Saint Anselm's Catholic School, elementary school. Sure. And um, so I would go there on I don't know every Wednesday. I was taken out of school, you know, to uh, go down there and uh, prepare myself for my first communion, and you know, then eventually for my confirmation. So I got to know the school, and then eventually, I guess after third grade, I said goodbye to my uh, the kids that I'd become friends with, and, uh, you know, she made the announcement to everyone, Angel's going to be leaving us, and, you know, ended up crying a little bit, you know, just feeling bad about leaving this place, but then ended up going down to uh, St. Anselm School, where I started in the fourth grade, and then I went there through um, till the eighth grade. Okay, wow, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, uh, you know, both my folks were... And so, you know, my, then my uh, second brother, Peter, Peter we called him, I mean, I was known as Angel, you know, sort of New York, English language stuff. Sure. I mean, my, our parents would speak to us often in Spanish, but, you know, also in English. Uh, as I just said, they were both pretty fluent. And my father was a social worker, mm. a caseworker. He, he didn't officially get an MSW, but he did do some graduate work I think it was at a Hunter College. He okay, took some yeah. courses at Hunter College. But that was it. He didn't complete the, a degree. And um, he specialized a lot in um, juvenile delinquency, uh, children and family services, and, um, you know, uh, sort of youth probation, youth on parole. And so he had a lot to do with like the, the, the local court system, the Bronx court system. Sure. And with some of the welfare agencies there. And what about your mom? So my mom, uh, was, you know, she wasn't a stellar student by her own admission in high school in Puerto Rico. She was, uh, you know, both folks were, uh, they were product of a little bit different upbringing. Um, the, you know, my father's side of the family, in, in broad terms, I would say, poorer and sort of darker skin. Sure. Not sort of, but definitely more brown skin. Yeah. So a lot closer to their black uh, roots sure. than on my mother's side. Uh, and nobody was making it past say, sixth grade, mm. among the Garcia siblings. Uh, they, were, they were of the family of Garcia and Lugo. Um, and my uh, grandmother survived longer. My grandfather uh, actually committed suicide. Oh. Um, I don't know if it was, he was suffering from tuberculosis or some serious uh, lung problem. And, you know, uh, so... He didn't last long, and so my father and everyone else really sort of had to, you know, do whatever work they could. They could. Sure. Um, but he would go to work, and he would also go to school. And work for him was cutting cane. Mm. Uh, he was a sugar cane cutter. 
And a lot of the sugarcane industry, uh, you know, that was, I think it was maybe the, the 20th century, going into end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and, you know, started to decline somewhat, but he was there. He was a, he was a cutter. And uh, he told me he, um, you know, and this was, and he said, you know, when you hear these stories about it, I walked 10 miles to get to, you know. Well, apparently, like, he did uh, quite a bit of walking to get to the fields and to get to the school. Yeah. But he was, um, this was to his credit and to his detriment, he was stubborn as a bull. Mm. And uh, he made sure that he was going to get his education, got the elementary education, got the high school education, and he signed up for the war. Uh, and like a few of his brothers, went to war in the Korean War. Um, the other brothers didn't uh, get that far. He had one sister, uh, Tutu, who was his favorite. Um, and uh, when he got back uh, from the Korean War, it shook him up. I mean, he, you know, occasionally he would mention that there were some really harrowing experiences sure. in the war. Um, and uh, he met my mom. My mom was whiter skinned, light skinned. Um, she was from the Martinez family, and Pedro Martinez, her father, was a baker. Mm. And he ran a business and he made all of these goods, but they were essentially to be sold on the street by all the children. And so he built up a business there, and he had himself, you know, a house uh, that uh, was there. I think was was a product of the of the time when uh, there was more s creation of suburban parcels and developments. Sure. So not quite the way the U.S. style is, but but similar. You know, she had all these concrete homes, pastel colored, you know, suburban, somewhat suburban streets, and and that's where they were. Um, and so, um, and she got her high school education. Met him in the course of meeting other youth from the town, and they fell in love, and they got married in 53, mm. just before Christmas. And, uh, you know, in 55, maybe. And then, uh, right, and then a year later, I was born. Sure. But it was right around Christmas time. And, um, and then, you know, um, she picked up some she did any more schooling but then she came to New York she was smart both of them were smart people and they could learn and she got herself a job in sort of secretarial roles mm. um, at one point I think with UJA mm, okay. United Jewish yeah. Appeal yeah yeah um, and then at another point with some other maybe with a law firm mm. and um, so she really picked up those Secretary of Skills and Steno. She showed us how she how to do Steno. Wow. How she did it. Um, and yeah, it's very successful there. And so um, she was able to negotiate, you know, in parent teachers conferences with things. Um, and um, and her sisters were in, you know, a good bunch of them came up to New York. And her sisters lived a couple of blocks away. We were on Tinton Avenue in the projects. And a couple of blocks away in multifamily buildings on Prospect Avenue. On Prospect, uh -huh. And so we had this connection. Sure. Uh, a lot of visiting back and forth and babysitting and going out on trips to Cretona Park, Pelham Bay Park, Astoria Park, uh, you know, then out to the beaches, to Orchard Beach, to Rockaway Beach, to, you know, Coney Island. And uh, mostly mom and her two sisters or one of the two sisters would... Um, uh, make these gatherings happen, and we go out there with our, our three girl cousins, yeah, uh, yeah, or two of them. You know, one one aunt had two girl children, two girls, and the other one had one, and mm -hmm. they were literally in the two in, in buildings next door to each other in Prosper. Wow. So we visit them a lot. Sure, sure. Um, and they all kept the secrets of uh, of the baking <laughs> for making all these great little, you know. Sweets and baked goods, uh, almohabanas, 
I don't know if you know these things. They're kind mm -hmm. of like um, they're like they're like white corn and yuca mm. meal and rice meal, little cheese fritters. Ooh. Oh yeah, they're, they're oh, God. dangerous. Yeah. You just pop them <laughs> yeah. all the time, and you know they would never give like the recipe for them. <laughs> but you had to have yucarina. Mm. There's a flour made from yuca. Yuca. Yeah. Could you and find the, that in the Bronx? It was. It wasn't always easy i think to find it there you know in recent times when my mom was uh coming back from puerto rico we would go to jackson heights mm. and in uh, colombian supermarkets there we could find it sure or, sure. or in supermarkets near the colombian you know communities and restaurants yeah uh, but i'm sure we must have found there must have been somewhere probably in el barrio yeah in yeah, east yeah. harlem uh where we could find that stuff and maybe a few good stores nearby too sure you know, in those days, we we were also able to like get like ham for cooking. Mm. My mother would send us as boys to the store and get coffee or quarter pound or half pound or a pound of um, jamón de cocinar, mm. cooking ham. There was also boiled ham that we would have to make our ham and cheese sandwiches, but sure. cooking ham was a different kind of a slab of ham and she says make sure they don't put any fat in there get the ham <laughs> you know sure. they're always trying to cheat you yeah 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 and we would always get also like coffee roasted coffee and it would be ground mm. right there at the store at the bodega wow wow yeah which was kind of these were like nice you know aromas and great things to purchase there. absolutely and that was right on tin tins well these would be uh the stores the, our two blocks didn't have any stores. We had playgrounds. Oh, sure. We had St. Anselm's uh, parking lot, the church, and the school. And then we had a couple of other playgrounds in back of us. But right next door on the block, like 152nd Street, or across the street on Westchester Avenue, mm. that's where you had some of the stores. Those sure. are big commercial strips. Um and uh, so we would go there to the bodegas. And there was a great little bakery, and there still is a great little bakery there on 152nd Street. Mm. Um, so it was good. It was fun. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, my mother would cook good classic Puerto Rican fare. Uh, you know, rice and beans, and there would be either tostones or maduros, you know, mm. the sweet plantains or the... Or the green plantains, fried uh, chicken, uh, fried chicken, pork chops, uh, you know, and then, you know, other sort of oddities. I mean, we're, people might think of them as oddities. We love this stuff, you yeah. know, like we make like uh, Libby's Vienna sausage. Mm. I never knew like where they came up with these like names or this packaging. Yeah. But, you know, we had some of this like canned food. So one was like, Libby's Vienna sausage, which could be cooked just like, you know, sort of fried on its own. Sure. And that's the meat dish, the meat part of the of the dish that went with rice and beans and yeah. maybe plantains or potatoes. Um, and aguacate, mm, avocado. Sure. You know. uh, but we would also have like these great soups. Uh, and we would also have the other canned thing was um, corn, canned corned beef. Oh, sure. So yeah, it's really, yeah. it was like corned beef hash. And one of the great dishes that we loved was this cooked corned beef hash would be put on top of the white rice. And mm. then you'd have like this canned corn. Yeah. Sweet corn. We'd put it on the side. Or rice and chickpeas. Mm, yeah. I mean, cooked like stewed chickpeas. Oh, sure. It's the sure. best. That was the most, that was the rarest kind of bean dish that we had. Chickpeas. We would, yeah, we would have regularly, right, you know, red beans or white beans. Um, I don't know if we ever had black beans in our home. A little, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but the red or the pink beans were the most regular. And then, you know, she would cook some stuff for my father, particular to him. And this showed like his real sort of uh, hibaro roots, I would sure. say. Sure. Uh, you know, from the country. I, I think these were more hibaro. Although, you know, the more suburbanized type families, the families that were doing a little bit better in some of these homes, I think they, they ate that stuff too. Yeah. Pig's feet. Mm -hmm. Pig's ears. Yeah. Tongue. Uh, 
you know, morcilla, this sort of intestines. Sure. Uh, but uh, there would also be like, and my mom knew how to cook it, so obviously it was like, it was part of her family fair too. Yeah. You know? Um, and, you know, my father loved that stuff in, in sauce. And with like some sides, sometimes she, um, she would prepare for him uh, gingombo. Hmm. Have you heard of that? I haven't, no. So that's okra. Oh, oh okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes, I don't that know, makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if we call it, I don't know if we ever, we ever actually have like a Spanish, quote, Spanish, Spanish name for it. Yeah. But maybe we call it okra. In Spanish, but we I've always known it as gingombo. Yeah. And so that's an African, you know, that's part of the African roots it's showing. Like, um, gumbo in Cajun cuisine is from is from that same word. Oh um, no, kidding! Because it's thickened with okra. Uh, oh really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, interesting. So, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which, uh, by the way, is delicious too. Gumbo. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> gumbo is great. Uh, I didn't have this because okra was like. <laughs> you know, when we were kids, it was like, I'm not eating that. Yeah. Or like, you know, cooked spinach or other things. Um, but, you know, I mean, for a while there, it was, it was my mom working and my father working at a certain point. Um, my father was, was rare in a number of different ways. So being this educated male, bilingual Puerto Rican, college educated, you know, everybody has some education. Sure. But he had the college education, and, and so he was a professional. And he's one of the few guys who could walk around the block in a suit. Yeah. And often in a three-piece suit. And, um, but, uh, and so he could probably, at some point, have, like, worked to help, you know, get us to, like, a home or something. I'm not sure. sure. You know, if there was a combination of the incomes. At that point, you had to be working in public mm. housing. Uh, you know, that, that was sort of the, one of those first requirements. They had a list of requirements sure. for public housing in the times when we were there. Again, we entered 1962, and that held for a while. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we grew up with other working, you know, class kids in that area. Uh, but my father was... Um, but, but, you know, ultimately realized my father wasn't going to come through. Yeah. He was an alcoholic mm. and that impacted, um, his, my aunt believes his, you know, sister, his beloved sister, sure. whom he grew up with and loved, loved him and he loved her. They were really sort of close and cared about each other. And we got to see their family out in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, Red mm. Hook, Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. But um, uh, she believes that the war uh, did that to him. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You know, who knows? War can do a lot of things to a lot of people. But it certainly shook him up. Sure. And that it was sort of, from, you know, at that time on that he developed this drinking habit. Yeah. So he was, you know, often able to, like, take care of work. And then there would be some occasional weekend time when he would go on a binge. Um, and then he would lay off of it and they'd be fine. And so he lost a few jobs in his life as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, but because he is a, a male bilingual Puerto Rican with a specialty in working with juvenile delinquents yeah. and children and family issues, uh, he was in demand. Mm, I bet, yeah. And he could get himself another job. Um, and, uh, but it held us back in terms of, you know, moving on to some other place. Sure. And what it meant also is that my mom needed to be in the workforce. Yeah. I think also my mom just wanted to. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, and to, she wanted to do it for her own sake, but she also wanted to, you know, make sure that there was enough income for sure. us. And she, um, and so she worked in these jobs, as I said, with a law firm and with, UJA, and I can't remember who else. So, you know, we needed to be taken care of somehow in terms of schooling. And so we would have for a while, one of my aunts uh, was looking after us, would come over and she would look after us. Uh, and then otherwise we had, I remember, I can remember at least one other caretaker, mm. Doña Carmen, mm. uh, who was, you know, kind of, 
and she was fine, you know, and she just kind of looking after us until whatever, five or six o'clock when mom would come back. Um, but she would, get, you know, she'd make some stuff and we weren't like too excited about what she was making. <laughs> so we'd find our way to get to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> And flush the bad stuff down the toilet, you know? Uh, sure. That's that's the way we were. We snuck around. You know, three boys. And yeah. And no one was really, including yours truly, no one was really sort of correcting the others. You know? <laughs> yeah, just playing uh, off of each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, she'd give us the creep sometimes because she had these, like, false teeth. And she'd take them off. And, you know, kind of gave us the, the heebie-jeebies in a way. But, you know, we grew up and we were there fine and we went through our years in St. Anselm's and we hung around with our friends from the building. Yeah. Um, that's one of those great things. You had about 114 apartments in this building. Sure. Uh, going up to the 15th floor. And, uh, you know, I had good friends and we went to school right next door and, and I hung out with them afterward, you yeah. know, outside. I mean, I always had to take care of my work, do my homework. Um and their parents were also like, you've got to get your work done as well. Sure. But, um, but we also, in the weekends, we got to hang around. Yeah. And became good friends through that time. Definitely. So, so that was good. Yeah. Yeah. What was um, the demographic makeup of the John Adams houses from what you remember? It was mostly Puerto Rican. Yeah. Uh, definitely a, a black population there. Uh, and... Uh, and then there were also some of the leftovers. Sure, yeah. The, the Irish leftovers. Yeah. Um, some good people. Uh, I mean, all the, all the rest. I mean, by and large, the, the tenants we, you know, in our buildings, we got along with well. Yeah. Having playgrounds around, you know, made it possible for people to come down and play. And they would be, you know, you could see them from your window. Sure. Um, and uh, so you had mostly, I guess, some of these Irish guys and a couple of Italian people, you know. There was uh, Frankie Carbone, mm -hmm. and, you know, one grade. I think he was in Peter's grade. I had this guy, uh, Stephen Sulo, mm -hmm. Italians. Um, they were living a couple of blocks away. And, you know, we all got along fine. We just grew up in, in, um, in our building... Uh, Joanne and Brendan and somebody else from this Irish family, Patrick. Sure. You know, uh, they were, right, they were the siblings, Joanne and Patrick and Joanne. And their dad and their mom, you know, we knew them and said hello to them. Everybody was on good terms. Yeah. Uh, no racial animosity that I could see. Yeah. Or ethnic animosity. Uh, we all went to the same school together and we all went to church together. Sure. And uh, different people like my mom or some of my friends' moms were like helpers at the church. Yeah. As women, they volunteered to clean the linens, you know, and clean the priest's robes. Yeah. And, and it was kind of a, you know, a big deal and an honor. Sure. And then we were altar boys. I was an altar boy. Yeah. At some point, I was, I think, president of the altar boy society. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think that's only because it's like I'm the dumb cluck who accepted the job, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Um, but, you know, so I got to, like, be with those friends. And, and that was sort of one group of friends. And I really, you know, appreciated them. Alberto and Nelson and Louis. Those are three Puerto Rican guys. And then we had this guy, John. Mm. John Tebow. Uh, African-American guy. A tall guy. Yeah. He was very much into dancing. And eventually, kind of, that was sort of his life, you know. We sure. would go down to John's house because he was the cool guy on the seventh <laughs> floor. And we'd hang out and we'd be listening to all this like funky music from Gladys Knight and all of the others. Um, and in a way, in that way, especially we were listening to pop radio at the time. Yeah. I was sort of, I think I felt raised more on like the R&B and popular music. Sure. You know, sort of popular white music, uh, rock and roll music, you know. Yeah. Whether it was the Rolling Stones or Gladys Knight and the Pips or... You know, these were the popular stations. Yeah. Um, that's what we would listen to at home on the radio. Okay, yeah. But also, you know, like in the weekends, like my my father particularly would want to listen to like, you know, the Spanish station or to sure. the oldies Spanish station. And so we got to hear some of that. Yeah. And we got exposed to that music more when we would go to the social club. Sure, sure. So my father belonged to a social club. All these guys who were also from 
his hometown, uh, Cabarojo, uh, from our hometown. Yeah. And these were all the guys that he was still in touch with up here. And these were his buddies. None of them professionals. Sure. Uh, but he could hang out with them. Yeah. And he loved to hang out with them. They were his buddies. And, you know, they drank together. Uh, but they all, you know, also just spend time, you know, shooting the breeze together. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they would come over to our house. We had this one guy who would sometimes play, you know, guitar. And yeah. I had kind of been interested in learning to play guitar. Still am, but... <laughs> yeah. Never, you know, I pick it up and then I learn some chords and then I have to drop, you know, doing it. For sure. But, um, um, and it's his style, sort of the Puerto Rican style. No, you just go like this and, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it was more sort of the informal and I think he was assuming that I would adopt that. But we didn't have any real, he just sort of did it. Yeah. In the one sort of couple of times that he came with his guitar. Um, and I don't remember his name, mm. but he was a great friend of my father's. There were about... It was maybe about a half dozen guys that we regularly would like run into. Sure. And they hung out in the social club uh, on a hundred and... Uh, near where the Segundo Ruiz Belvis mm. uh, clinic is now, the health center. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. So we're talking like St. Anne's and Brook Avenue, okay, around 143rd yeah. Street, 142nd Street. Um, and it was near, I guess, I didn't think about it at the time, but St. Francis Hospital was near there. Mm. It existed there. And, uh, and it was, you know, uh, and we would go there. It was Saturday night. That was the party. Yeah. We're going, you know, we're just marching along into the car, get down there. And, and we were having a, the Saturday night time. My mom would hang out with the ladies. The guys would hang out with each other. And then maybe they'd play dominoes. And music was playing, and we danced with whatever girls were there. Yeah, sure. But we'd also run around, and, and it was fun. Sure, sure. What kind of dancing would you do at the social club? Just, you know, just sort of salsa dancing. Sure, sure, In sure. whatever way we could, you know. Sure. Uh, but that was all Latin. It was all, you know, the artists of the day. I'm thinking, you know, late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. Because I graduated from St. Anselm's 1970. Mm. So it was sort of the time leading up to then. Sure. Yeah, late, right. It was all late 60s, early 70s. You know, salsa, this new Absolutely, yeah. thing was forming. But, you know, people had been, had been playing music like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, Willie Colon and Absolutely, Hector yeah. Lavo and some others, at, I think at the time is what we were listening to. Yeah. It was a great song, Che Che Cole, mm. which was a song that uh, Willie Colon made famous in his band that sort of stuck with me from that time. That yeah. was a song I associate, I can visualize being in the social club and dancing and, you know, sure. just sort of running around. Sure. And it was fun. Yeah. It was yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you all ever go to any um, uh, venues where there'd be live music um, around the Bronx? I did not. Mm. We did not. Um, I don't know if my mother and father did, but I don't, maybe they might have gone in early years to go dancing like to a, a Palladium yeah. or Teatro Puerto Rico, but I'm not, sure. I don't know if they would, they did that. Sure, I don't sure, know if they sure. did that. They just, they were looking after us and, um, uh, my mother's younger sister, Minna. Mm. Um, she liked to go dancing. She liked to go out and go dancing. I bet she probably did that a few times. Yeah. Yeah. There are some really great clubs around yeah. the Bronx. Oh, around. yeah. Yeah. I mean, all around New York City. But yeah. Like... I mean, the social clubs were essentially, this was, you know, this was the party. This was where you could dance and you could eat food and you could drink yeah, and you could, yeah. and, and you could uh, just sort of feel like you were at home. Sure. You know, in my in my uh, book, uh, one of the things I talked about was how these everybody was in these like densely packed, crowded blocks. Yeah, and so there was no way to to like sort of capture any of that sense of community of being in the in the pueblo or the campo or the municipio where your people were from. Sure. And so these social clubs were like a, a big deal. Yeah. I didn't think about it at the time, but I think this was the way that you could kind of like 
break through and find your people again. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Um, even though, as I said, we got along in good terms, said hello to everybody in the elevators, and we knew the parents, you know, the kids and the parents, and all the parents knew each other and looked out for each other in our building. But still, this was another way to... Because many of the other people that, that we were getting together with, they were from the local apartment buildings, sure. which were a little bit more run down. Sure, you know, sure. the public housing projects were pretty much, for those first couple of decades, they were well maintained. Absolutely. They were considered like the gold standard. Yeah. And they helped us sort of avoid, on a certain level, seeing the South Bronx become the South Bronx, on a yeah. certain level. Yeah. Uh, we didn't, uh, I mean, we knew about sort of gangs and we knew about heroin and, sure. and, and, and junkies, you know, because they were, of course, these multifamily apartment buildings just outside of us Yeah, that many people came from to come to our school. Uh, but I, you know, didn't remember sort of seeing fires happen yeah. then or seeing buildings go vacant then. Yeah. Uh, by the time, yeah. Because after 1970, I was going downtown to high school. I went to Regis High School. Ah, okay, okay, on sure. On the east side of Manhattan, the Jesuit High School. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and I believe that was because of, you know, my what I, my, what I call my own version of affirmative action. Sure, sure. So we used to go, my mom would encourage us to go, take part in these like after school and summer programs. She actively encouraged that. So down the block from us at PS5 on Jackson Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of an important building for different reasons. Right at the, at the corner of Jackson and 149th Street, they had this program called SOMPSEC. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the acronym stood mm -hmm. for, but it was this after school program that was housed there. And uh, it might have been one of the CEDA programs. Okay. Uh, CEDA was this like federal act that helped push uh, uh, youth employment and training. Uh, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, mm. CETA or CETA. And so I think a lot of the counselors were funded by that. And that helped to like make some of these programs happen. And so it would be a mix, you know, mostly we were there just like maybe do some tutoring and maybe some reading, but also just recreation. Sure. And we'd go down there as kids um, on our own. It wasn't a big deal to go on our own. Yeah. And uh, we did that, I think, maybe for a couple of years, maybe for a couple of summers. And then uh, we had across the street, across the street, across the hall from us in this apartment, uh, the Reyes family. Mm. And one of the Reyes... And these are smart kids. They were all. Uh, and uh, Marilyn, who was there, Marianella Reyes, she was in my class. So I went over to like, you know, hang out with her a lot, uh, particularly like sixth, seventh, eighth grade. But her brother, her older brother, Jose Reyes, it was interesting. He was, it seemed like briefly he was a member of the Young Lords. Okay, yeah. But he was also this like uh, kind of an academic guy would wear the academic, you know, uh, no rim glasses. Sure. Soft spoken guy, but, you know, very, uh, very interesting guy. And it turns out that he was also with Aspida. Mm. And Aspida was this organization, uh, you know, it was formed by Dr. Antonia Pantoja, uh, who formed a number of Puerto Rican organizations at the time. Sure. She was very active in, in the city and in the Bronx. And she um, did a lot of stuff in the late 60s, mid to late 60s, forming these organizations. And so she formed Aspida. And so we went for a, two summers at least to this Aspida program on 149th Street near the hub, mm -hmm. near 149th Street and 3rd Avenue. Sure. There was a little place that we went up the stairs. I think now there's like a security agency huh. thing there. But at the time... It was like this cool place to go. And it was half and half. It was, we did some academics and we were always working on improving our reading and math levels. Yeah. Then. But then we also like, you know, it was time for recreation. Sure. And so we'd go on these trips. 
right, or wherever, in all the classic places, whether it's the pool or the park or the beach or the zoo or the botanical gardens, you know, and we had these counselors who were taking us there. Yeah. So we had this like great exposure. Sure. You know, uh, a fun exposure to schooling. So you combine that, and then in fifth grade, right around fifth grade, a few of us, a handful of us, were uh, selected to take part in a program at Fordham. Mm. And Fordham had this tutoring program. So the college students at Fordham were providing tutoring to kids who had some potential. Yeah. And by that time, you know, my reading scores were very good and my other scores were good. I was, you know, an A student and uh, looked upon that way, yeah. and sometimes pejoratively. Sure, sure. Uh, but, uh, uh, and so I went and I took this bus, you know, as a fifth grade, I was taking it in the bus all the way up to Fordham with, with a couple of my friends from school. We got to get out early or something. Yeah. And we were getting this tutoring. Wow. And um, so again... We're getting all these academic enhancements. We had potential, yes. But we were getting this, like, there were these opportunities along the way. Sure. Uh, to be engaged and to be academically, you know, challenged. And it was there, actually, at, at Fordham that one of the guys was telling me in his earliest fifth grade about this, like, great school, Regis High School. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, what's that? And he explained to me, he says, you know, you, you keep going and, you work on your studies and you might be able to get to that school. It's like one of the really good schools in the city. Yeah. So that kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And then a couple of years later, the teacher is, you know, or the principal comes into the classroom and is saying that there's a call for anyone who might be interested in taking the Regis High School entrance exam. Mm. And it's like, ding, ding. Oh, I remember hearing about that. And so I took the exam and hallelujah, I passed. Yeah. You know, and I was excited. And, you know, I would share this news with my friends and they were going to their high schools mostly they were going to the public high schools in the area whether it was Clinton or uh, Morris or or one of the other one yeah uh, this one guy Louis was this you know talented guy artist and he ended up going to um, high school of fashion and art oh wow okay yeah. yeah so that was he was that was one of the special schools yeah um, and, uh, but we stayed in touch and we stayed in touch through the years. These are like my friends from the block. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. We, we hung out, Alberto and Nelson. And, and then, you know, we added a couple of new friends, this guy, Danny, and this guy, Jimmy, who lived downstairs from me. And we were always sort of banging on the pipes. <laughs> you know, he's on the ninth floor. He's in 9G. I'm in 10G. Yeah. So he's <laughs> knock on the pipe. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and I said, uh oh, it's Jimmy. And we look out the window and he says, yo, what's up? Come on down. <laughs> and, you know, and that was kind of the way that we were able to sort of navigate in the building and spend time with each other's family. Yeah. So, um, and so that was fun. Um, and, uh, you know, we were lucky. We avoided some of the troubles of, of drugs and gangs. Sure. Uh, and we get into some fights not much. I wasn't, you know, a fighter. Yeah. Uh, my brothers got probably got into more fights, and huh. uh, they were more courageous, I guess. Um, and you know, we would play stickball. Yeah. And we'd play, you know, softball. And we'd play basketball. We play slugs. I don't know if you ever played that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a it's long, kind, long time. It's kind of an life. inverse handball. Yeah. You know, instead of, uh, yeah. So, you know, you're, you're slapping it down. And in St. Anselm's, in the schoolyard, there were these four walls. Mm. And so at lunchtime, or at the beginning of school or after school, what did we do? We would be playing slugs there. And yeah. there'd be four lanes. And you're trying to, like, hit the ball down against the wall. And you're trying to get the guy out, get into the first, first lane. And whoever gets the first, I don't know if we played the 21 points, but it was something like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we play stickball on the wall. Sure. Uh, we made a we made a picture of home plate, basic or of a strike zone. Yeah. And you had to hit that that strike zone to be able to get a strike. And uh, someone was playing with their you know the broomstick, and 
I pitched too many home runs. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> but it was fun. You know. Uh, I didn't hit too many home runs, but I pitched too many. <laughs> you, you pitched a lot. But, yeah. but I loved it. You know. Yeah. Uh, and we played football in the schoolyard, and the schoolyard was open. Um, and I'm a clutch, by the way. You know, I mean, like, I'm not, I just wasn't an athlete, but I loved sports, and sure. I loved playing in these sports. Um, and uh, then across the street, there was a handball court, and that became the focus of our of our time, especially when we were, you know, in the high school years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother, uh, Pedro, uh, Peter, and his friend Danny, who was another friend of mine up on the 14th floor, they got really good. They got really good at handball, uh, to the point where they were playing against some of the guys who were really good there. Yeah. And when they were playing really good players, they were playing for money. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we would just like watch, you know, because I was not, you know, I wasn't that, that, that quality of handball player. And my other brother either also a, time, a few times played for money, too. Sure. Um, so that was kind of the experience of growing up, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then there were times, you know, economically speaking, there were times when, when things were a little bit hard. Um, and, uh, you know, my mom had to look after us and she might not have had a babysitter. And uh, so we went on welfare for a while. Sure. You know? it, wasn't, it wasn't always there, but it was there at a certain point. Absolutely. And she had to... Um, you know, and that's what she had to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and so there was a time I remember when, like, I don't know, it might have been three days straight or something. You know, we were living off pancakes. Oh, yeah, sure. And that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so fortunately, you know, I mean, eventually, fortunately, mom was able, I don't know if it was mom was able to get a job or finally able to wrangle my father into, like, you know, paying up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was there, and sometimes he wasn't there. Mm. Um, and uh, and you know this life of of, of visiting them with families and going out with families that still happened. Yeah. His his family was mostly the family that we visited in Sunset Park, and it's kind of the the border between Sunset Park and Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Sure. Fifty Third Street was the subway stop that we took when we went with my mother. If my father was not going to be driving us, when we went with my mother, we took the double R, mm. what was then the double R, down to 53rd Street and 4th Avenue, and then walk a couple of blocks in. And my father's sister, Tutu, she lived in one with her family, her husband and, and three kids. And then my father's brother, Juanito, lived a couple of blocks away with his wife. And they I think they had five kids. Wow, yeah, yeah. And But we, you know, we loved going to one or the other and visiting with them. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to see Brooklyn. And uh, my mom would always, like, make sure that we got a chance to go out, and, like, you know, that we were not just trapped in our neighborhood either. Sure, sure. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, we didn't feel it was a trap. We had a chance to hang out with our friends. Yeah. But, um, but she also, like, took us to the movies. You know, here was my mom taking the three of us boys. And we went to see uh, Help. Ah, okay. You yeah. know, the Beatles movie. Yeah. And there was another movie, uh, A Hard Day's Night, maybe. Or mm. We got to see that in the movie theater. Um, and, and there were a couple of others. But, Which you know, uh, movie theater would you go um, to? I don't, I don't remember. You know, I think we would... I think we would go downtown somewhere. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Because on Prospect Avenue, there was the RKO Franklin... And the Prospect Theater. Yes. At one point. Yeah, know. Prospect Theater. We used to go there some uh, sometimes as kids, and there was an amazing, what we thought was an amazing pizzeria next mm. door, where you could get this massive slice. Oh wow! Yeah. For like ten cents. Oh wow! <laughs> and you know, but but we did go into that movie theater. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if we went there with my mom. I think it was just you know when when the guys decided. We could get the money from our parents and we could go see that movie, whatever sure, that movie sure, was. Sure. I, I had the feeling mom took us downtown. Yeah. Maybe like 59th Street, maybe 86th Street. Sure. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was kind of fun. Yeah, um, yeah what uh, was, 
as far as um the the Puerto Ricans you knew in your neighborhood, um, would you say many of them were still very close to the rural life? Um, um you know, I think they had be. I, you know, it's hard to say. Like, you know, you could have your dishes and your food. But you know, I don't. I think we there was a lot of commonality of that, of that food. Um, you know, people. Uh, I think this is one of these things I checked out. I read about it later on. I realized, oh, this is what was going on. But uh, you know, we Puerto Ricans, like those that were coming from the. At, at more rural areas, and there were a lot of us, yeah. a lot of, you know, like that's where my father was from. Sure. My father's roots were much more rural. Um, and so in those areas, uh, without much access to a formal church, yeah, people had altars in their homes. Yeah. Right? That was just part of being Catholic. That sure. had nothing to do with anything. But then they also had like some of the features of the altars were, of course, some of the, you know, the, the saints represented as black saints, yeah, yeah. as well as the, the white saints. And, and uh, some of the figures of uh, uh, Santeria, sure, you know, sure. also in there. Um, and you'd have rosaries and you'd have the Bible, you'd have maybe like some candles and some water. And some other, like maybe some fruits, you know, it was like this offering. Yeah. Uh, often near the door. Or in some key corner near the door. Sure. Uh, and so that was, that was part of it. You know, that was part of, that was there in some places, in some of people's, you know, uh, apartments. Um, and I would see some of that. I, I associate that a little bit more with the rural you know, upbringing. Um, I had, this, I might have mentioned this, I had this uh, girlfriend in high school. And so, I don't know if I should mention this now, but... Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think this is So, this, this uh, I, you know, great young woman, I mean, great teen, uh, sort of a first love, Yolanda, mm. uh, Jolie. So, as I said, we went, we handball, this handball court became sort of a real central focus of our teen lives, yeah. uh, high school lives. And so these girls used to come by, these teen girls would come by as we teen boys were there hanging out in the handball court. We'd watch games, but we were also just hanging out. And um, uh, Jolie was one of them, and we eventually, used to, you know, fell for each other and started going out. And my brother was going out with one of the girls, and a, and a friend of mine, Jimmy, was going out with the other girl, and... Danny was going out with the other girl, Yvette, and they were all friends with each other. They yeah. all went to Grace Dodge Vocational High School mm. up by uh, near 180th Street, along like Prospect Avenue. Mm. This was a commercial high school at the time. And um, so I would go visit Jolie's house and her family, and there was her father, who was kind of this gruff construction worker. Yeah. He seemed to be more in tune with the city, a little bit more urban, right? But the, the his wife, Amalia, the shorter woman, and she looked to me always like, uh, you know, old style woman with the l somewhat longer skirt, uh, didn't want to, you know, reveal. And so it impressed me more of like an older style, almost like an evangelical person, but I don't know that she was actually sure. evangelical. I think she was a Catholic. Yeah. And uh, but came more from the countryside, and when I would go to pick up Jolie to go, like we were working together in a uh, in college years, in one or two of our college years, we were both working for the city, mm. and we'd go downtown take the train together. I'd pick her up, and uh, uh, and then I would also pick her up when I we were going to go out together, and so I visit her place. And they were in this old apartment building, large apartment building on St. Anne's Avenue, mm. 710 St. Anne's. And I think she was maybe on the first floor or something, maybe the second floor. But you knew that you were near her place because you would hear, <laughs> it was a rooster. 
<laughs> and they kept us roosted during all this time that I was there. Wow, yeah. Uh, that's pure country. I think Absolutely. that's more, you know. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, <coughs> I don't know if I'd want to be the neighbor of that person, but you know, <laughs> one person's dog is another person's rooster, right? I mean, yeah. the pets that you keep in your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, and, and so that was a sign. And then there would always be, and then there were like other things I learned from her about the way that you communicate, you signal certain mm. good things and you could potentially signal certain bad things if you were not aware mm. uh, with certain gestures or words, you know. If you look at someone uh, with a new baby, right? Sure. Uh, people say, you know, ay que lindo, que linda, que Dios lo bendiga. Mm. May God bless that child. Look, what a beautiful child. May God bless. If you don't say may God bless, I was told by Jolie, mm. and this was her upbringing from her mom. Sure. It's like you're you're casting the evil eye. Ah, yeah, yeah. Which is really kind of bizarre, right? I yeah. mean, I think, well, no, who does that? But, you know, then again, everybody shakes hands. Yeah. You, you and I would have shaken hands today. Yeah. And why do people shake hands? So that someone could show that they weren't carrying a knife and, you know, behind them. Yeah. You know, to go after an enemy. So, you know, these, I mean, these are, those are the old gestures. Obviously, I'm not coming in here with a knife behind me, but these are the, the this is embedded in the culture Absolutely. that we have this day and age. Absolutely. Uh, other people obviously will greet each other with the prayer greeting or whatever, but that's part of at least the culture in America and, sure. uh, and, and maybe in other Western countries that we have. So you don't send the wrong signals. Yeah. And that, I think, was part of her mother's, like, upbringing about the, the way that you relate to other human beings. Sure. And the values of cooperation and of goodwill. Yeah. Um, and these are like, you know, this is fundamental stuff. Because Absolutely. otherwise it's like, oh, my God, that person is wishing my child yeah. ill will. Do I want to deal with that person? You know? Yeah. So, and then always, you know, part of that also is you always want to be welcoming to people. Well, sure. I, are you welcoming? You could do like Amalia did, good old Amalia. Which one, Amalia is a, was a shorter person. You know, I don't think she reached five. Yeah. Five feet. Uh, Jolie was about taller, relatively taller, about you know, maybe five, 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 six or something. Um, but, you know, she could also like pack a punch. I mean, she was you know, a little stocky. Yeah. Um, but very gracious and uh, very friendly. And uh, if you were good to her daughter, then you were a good guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you should be received well. And, you know, but that was kind of, she would always, com she would communicate that to me. Sure. Uh, but also, like, for anyone who was coming to the house, there was a, a big vat. Uh, I think it was, you know, from here up to, like, <laughs> you know, the height of, of my arm, my forearm up to the tip of my my fingers a big vat of rice wow, of white wow, rice yeah and she regularly had that when i came to visit the house what was that about and again jolie communicated to me she says well you never want to be if someone came by yeah you don't want to be empty-handed and you don't want them to feel bad you know what if they're hungry what if they would like to eat you know, this was the gesture sure. of of the family to any stranger, to any yeah. visitor. Um, and so that was part of, like, that's how you relate to people in society. You give them what you've got. Absolutely. You know? um, so that was, I think, I think that was, I think that was stronger in the country than one, once we started modernizing and suburbanizing. I don't think that that happened that often. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So that was kind of a trait that I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, the thing is, who just, who will just sort of go in and say, hey, how are you doing? I just wanted to come by. I mean, people do do that. There is sort of that informality, I think, among uh, Puerto Rican people. Um, I think that was a carryover from the days in the country or in the pueblos where we grew up that you felt like you could you know, uh, drop by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And say hello to a neighbor. 
Um, and I think that's more of kind of small town or, or country light. Sure. That people feel that they've got neighbors and they can say hello to each other. Um, I think in most cultures, but I, you know, certainly that was it, I think, in Puerto Rico. And, um, you know, they wanted to make sure that, like, she was growing up the right way. She was going to be, you know, she didn't go to Catholic school, but she did have her communion and her baptism and all of those things did happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, she wanted to make sure that uh, her daughters got a good education. She wanted to make sure that her daughters had a good life. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, she wanted them to like learn and to make themselves better. But I think probably she had more of this wish for them to marry well. Sure, sure. Or to marry into a good household into a man who would be a good provider, good to them, you know, treat them right, but would be a good provider. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what she expected out of her husband. You yeah. Know? And I think there was some time when her husband, uh, Yolanda's father, was not being good. Mm. Uh, you know, a suspicion of maybe being unfaithful. Yeah. And uh, he came to the house, apparently. This was... Uh, and he opened the door, and Amalia had devised this configuration. It was like a pail <laughs> of urine. <laughs> um, oh, wow. That was set to go mechanically. When that door opened... It tipped over, and boom, the whole thing fell on him. Brilliant. <laughs> and this was how she kind of let him know, okay, I am the woman. I've, I've got to play the role. I'm going to keep the house clean. I'm going to cook. I'm gonna, but you are going to take care of me, and you're not going to mess with me. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know? I yeah. wasn't violence, but, but it's kind of you're not going to mess with me. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it was just... <sighs> It was this, you know, there were these ways of communicating and of dealing with with uh, uh, loyalty and respect and openness to the neighbor and, you know, and the old life that uh, she kept, she preserved. Sure, sure. And that was kind of cool for me to hear about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and what about uh, as far as, uh, like, the idea of family, because you mentioned to me before um, that, you know, there, there are plenty of people that you might call cousin or uh -huh. aunt or uncle who weren't necessarily related to you, but, right. um, you know, that were very close with, with your family. Is that something that translated, um, at least in your experience, uh, into the Bronx, or is that something that you'd more experience in Puerto Rico whenever you'd go back? Hard to say. I don't remember that too well. I mean, you know, there were people that, I don't remember it with us. There were these various people where, you know, people would say, oh, yeah, say hello, to that's your cousin. Yeah, yeah. That's my cousin. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's a, they were, you know, raised by so-and-so, who was your father's stepbrother, who was, um, so, you know, get a little bit of that in, in my experience. This is from my experience. Sure. Um, but I, I'm trying to remember if there was somebody specifically who it was. I know I must have run into a couple of people who would say, "Well, you know, basically this is my son." Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I raised him. Yeah. You know. Um, but I just I I can't specifically remember that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, you know, I would find out about, the, but I did find out about, oh, this particular cousin or that cousin. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, all of these various. Uh, and there were cousins of my father who were more, you know, they were practically like sisters, very close. Yeah. And so they used to come, you know, uh, a couple of them would come to the house and we would hang out with their children, and we think of them as our cousins, but uh, I guess essentially they were somehow second cousins. To yeah, us, you know? some, something like that. Yeah, 
I mean, we think of like my father's cousin, Mercedes, for example. Yeah. We would think of her as kind of Titi Mercedes, mm. our aunt Mercedes. Yeah. But she was actually our, you know, whatever that cousin configuration is. Yeah. She was my father's first cousin. Sure. And, you know, whatever relation we are to her, and then whatever relation, our, like our cousin Ben, we're still in touch with very much. Yeah. You know, great guy. And uh, uh, so you have these, like, cousin relationships that are almost like siblings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, uh, going back to the church for a little bit, what yep. would you say the role of Saint Anselm's was in your neighborhood as far as uh, the community went? Yeah, well, I think it was a, um, it you know it was important um, in the school. You know, you also you had these various. Um, uh, you know, you had sports played there. Sure. The CYO League, Catholic Youth Organization League. Um, so you had, you know, whether it was baseball or basketball, um, that that would happen there. And so I think that attracted more than just the kids from the school. Yeah. Because you had a lot of the kids from the school in there. Um, and people came to Mass, right, whether they were, their kids were in the school or not. Yeah. Um, uh, and so they were coming from all of the, you know, seven buildings around. So that drew attention. Uh, and uh, I don't remember if there was any kind of like, I'm trying to remember if there was any kind of like community program there mm. outside of the sports. Um, I don't, I don't think there was at, at the time in those years we were growing up in the 60s, yeah. 70s. Because, yeah, because we would go to these other schools, to Samsek or to Aspida, to PS5, to PS130. Um, um, and, you know, we were part of um, the, the choir there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we had this guy, Jimmy Donahue. Yeah, another, yeah. Another one of the leftovers. Yeah. Who was a very good guitar player in, in you know, as this, like, seventh, eighth grader. Yeah. Um, and um, so we got involved with that, you know, that choir, and we'd have practice there. Sure. So there were these different, like, events that we could engage in some church activity or another. The altar boys meeting, uh, you know, uh, and I think, you know, with so many people at the time going to church there, and with a good number of people being able to afford school there, yeah. remember, there were still a lot of nuns. Yeah. This was dominated by nuns. There were some lay persons coming in. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, the nuns came cheap. Yeah, yeah, and the lay persons did not. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, their livelihoods were their lifestyles were different, and the livelihoods, their needs for uh, housing, etc., yeah. were not as significant as those of lay persons who had to like pay the rent in New York City. Absolutely, you know? uh, and who wanted to have a, a career, a teaching career. Sure. And all the nuns were essentially teachers, um, and then. Uh, but, but, and, you know, we had our experiences with the discipline, and we all have our jokes about getting wrapped on the head or on the knuckles, yeah. you know, by yeah. the teacher's ruler. Uh, and, uh, but the point is that all of that meant that a lot of students were in there, a lot of people from the neighborhood were there. Yeah. And it drew from even beyond the John Adams houses. Sure. Uh, uh, my cousins, who were on Prospect Avenue... My very good friend Millie Bonilla, who's an organizer in the South Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we grew up together. She was coming from Prospect Avenue and Fox Street, and so this extended, you know, its reach was was there. Yeah. And so Saint Anselm's was known, you know, around that area. Um, uh, 
Uh, yeah. And, you know, the schoolyard, as I said, everybody was playing in that schoolyard. That was an open schoolyard. Yeah, so all yeah, the kids yeah. could, could play there. Um, and, you know, some people had, like, you know, street football, touch football, you know, leagues and games going on there. So it was very, very much a place for recreation. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So it was good that way. And then we had, like, we participated in the annual school play. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. always the spring musical. And, uh, and we had, you know, and people from the community came to participate in it, you know. Yeah. Yours truly, I think, played, I think, Christopher Columbus in some musical. <laughs> I can't even remember. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, Or it was yeah. in the Easter, you know, pageant. Uh, sure. Playing Peter Cottontail. I can't remember <laughs> what, you know, what roles. But, you know, and it was great. And it was all a way to create even more community within within that school. But I'm I'm guessing, you know, a lot of the people again who participated were from non school, non church uh, community. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um which languages were was the mass set in once uh, the mass started being set in the vernacular? I mean there was an English mass and a Spanish mass. Okay, English and yeah, Spanish. And then yeah. I think you know, it was pretty full house. Yeah. Both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the Spanish mass was probably, um, I think it was dominant, mm. but I think there would have been a good time when, when there would have, the English, English, English mass would have been large because we were all supposed to go as youth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were all supposed to go to mass. Sure. <laughs> and so, uh, and we needed to be able to show that we were making the, the payments as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The contributions. Uh, doing the collections and we had collections envelopes and all that stuff. We had a show at a school that we were going to mass um, So it was pretty good turnout at, at those English masses as yeah, well. Yeah, and that's yeah. where as I said we participated in the choir I mean a few of us participated in the choir. Sure uh, Well, I remember singing only these English songs. Yeah, but I'm sure you know in the Spanish ones they had their own You know strong choir and I think I was I guess when I was an altar boy, I was saying mass for both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I can't remember ever noticing. Let's see, fourth grade, fifth grade, that would have been 10, 12. That would have been 66, 60, so just Vatican time. Yeah. Yeah. And I just don't remember. Was I learning new signals for when to ring the bell? Yeah, yeah. You know, or that's a really good question. Yeah. 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 Was there, was there much when you were growing up in the way of kind of lay devotion associated with the parish or, um, or it, it still was taking a while for, uh, for the effects of Vatican II to, um, to spread along, along those lines. Yeah, I just, I just. Uh, don't remember. I know that they were societies yeah. that were being formed. Yeah. Um, but I don't remember, for example, like, I'm trying to think, like, would my mom have thought about being, did they form a parish council? Would my mother have been part of that at that time? Yeah. In uh, those late uh, 60s? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. My mom benefited uh, from some of the public school activism mm. that was going on, uh, the bilingual education activism. Oh, sure, sure. So my mom heard about uh, this. My mom had had this idea when she was growing up about being a teacher. Mm. That's what she told me then. And... United Bronx Parents was this organization that was being formed there. And there was, you know, uh, an amazing leader. Mm. Uh, another amazing leader. So the Aspira, you had Antonia Pantoja. And uh, uh, this amazing leader was Evelina Lopez Antonetti. Mm. She was the founder of this, and she really wanted to make sure that Puerto Ricans did not all get lost yeah. in the public education system with the language difficulties on the one hand and not everybody had Ida Martinez 
who was very bilingual yeah. and was so good in the English that, you know, a, a large Jewish nonprofit was happy to have her do their typing for them. Yeah. Or yeah, law yeah. firm, okay, who could eventually save my butt, <laughs> right, from condemnation that I got from that first grade yeah. teacher at that PTA uh, meeting, at that parents' conference meeting, right? Not that many people had two at least high school educated parents as we did. We were really sure. fortunate. And so somebody had to be there to be somehow make sure that not so many kids were getting lost in the system. Yeah. United Brunch Parents is formed. Evelina Lopez Antonetti is the form founder and the leader. And she started, she eventually, uh, her advocacy took it to the point where she was able to get the teachers union and the then board of education to agree to set up a uh, a para program, a para professional mm. program that would allow people who had at least a high school education, bilingual people, yeah, to get into this. To be employed as paraprofessionals, as essentially the teacher's assistant sure. in these classes, in these in these schools, um, to enable, you know, to enable the to, to bridge that language gap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because they were not hiring Spanish-speaking teachers fast enough for all of us Puerto Ricans who needed the education. Sure, sure. We're talking about a time. You know, the ultimate net migration, largely in New York City, in that time, was 750,000 people. Yeah, yeah. From Puerto Rico. Not a great, you know, not many of them having gotten that high school education to at least have picked up enough English. They all come here, and uh, many, many kids and teens. Yeah coming in, having to navigate the public school system. And so this was a real, you know, victory that she has secured. Yeah. My mother hears about this at an information session in the neighborhood. So again, talking about the proximity of all of these important influences nearby. Absolutely. So I told you, Aspida was over, I mean, Aspida was, a, was two doors down from us because Jose Reyes was there yeah. letting us know about this program. Uh, but it was, you know, a couple blocks down, a few blocks down, 149th Street, about 10 blocks down, uh, near the hub. And then in the other direction, on Prospect Avenue, uh, across the street from PS 130, where I had gone to school, Yeah, that's where United Bronx Parents was. And so they were having the information session. My mom attends this and says, I'm going to do this. Wow, yeah. And that led to her... Being a paraprofessional at PS25, mm. which was four blocks down on Tintin Avenue yeah. and 149th Street. And it was called, and is still called, the Bilingual School. Yeah. It was the first bilingual school in the city. Amazing. Yeah. And she became, she was this teaching assistant and worked hard, worked her way through. But the, the you know, the, the great thing that, that um, Lopez Antonetti had secured was that these teaching assistants could also get their education paid for. Oh, spectacular. And they yeah. could get an associate's degree and they could get a bachelor's degree uh, so that they could become a teacher. Yeah. And that's what my mom did. Wow. And so she got that at Bronx Community College, the associates, and then the bachelor's degree at uh, Lehman College. Wow, yeah. And um, she was doing that at night while she was doing the work in the day yeah. and then had to go home and she was always cursing out the uh, school system, the Board of Ed, because they wanted lesson plans. Yeah, yeah And these yeah, yeah. lesson plans, I don't know if you've seen any of this, but they had to be really detailed. Yeah, every single with day. With goals, <laughs> objectives, activities, and they had to be prepared every single day. Um, and that's what she, you know, was going through as she was becoming uh, a full-fledged teacher. Yeah, wow. My brother, just sort of a quirk of fate, but, you know, my brother had uh, 
he had sorted out at Fordham. Uh, he partied too much, and, and so he didn't make it through beyond the first year. He was very bright. I mean, if we were all, thankfully, given a good genes by our parents. Yeah. Uh, and he had gone to Cardinal Hayes High School, made it into Fordham. Uh, was, you know, as I said, just was having a good time in college. And then he just, you know, dropped out. And uh, spent a couple of years being a waiter mm. at the Venice restaurant. And then eventually decided to come back, got his act together, went to Lehman College. Yeah. Well, he and my mother graduated together. Oh, wow. How about that? Yeah, it was really nice. <laughs> it was a great picture of them in their cap and gown sitting next to each other in the graduating class. Yeah. It was really cool. <laughs> that is really very, cool. Very, very yeah. cool. Um, and then she took it one step further uh, because you you could get the master's degree. And in, in fact, you really, you kind of were expected to get the master's degree. Yeah. And again, she went to these schools because the contract was with these schools. Sure. U of T slash Department of Ed. I don't know who was who was putting what. The Board of Ed that was paying for this and to develop the next crop of teachers. So the contract was with Bronze Community to mm -hmm. pay for my mom's education. The contract was with Lehman College to pay for her bachelor's degree. And then there was a contract for the master's program, which she had to do out in Brooklyn, oh, downtown wow. Brooklyn, LIU Brooklyn, wow. Long Island University of Brooklyn. Why did she have to go down there? That's where the contract was. Yeah. And if that was her, her, her door to a free education and the master's degree, that's what she was going to do. And yeah. She hauled it out there and, you know. Was there were a number of times when we would meet her at the subway station because she'd have to be coming back at night. I'm sure, yeah. And, you know, it was a little tricky those years in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but uh, she was determined. Yeah. And uh, she always loved us, always looked after us, you know, always cared for us, uh, while at the same time trying to figure out her career and her life, you know, while navigating this life with my father. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we lost her last uh, April oh. uh, to the COVID virus. Oh, um, definitely, yeah. But um, she, you know, we gave her our, uh, everything we could in, in the nursing home that she was in the last, you know, 11 years. And people would mo would look at myself and my brother and say, God, you guys are always, you're, you visit her so often and you're, you know, so good and we can see the love. And I said, you got to see what she gave us. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> you would yeah. understand why we're why we're doing this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She sounds like she was a remarkable woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, uh, whatever her teaching skills were that she was putting to work, making sure I wasn't going to flunk the first grade. Yeah, you know that was working through all through the years, <laughs> and she would. Uh, I'm I'm a you know almost a, a certified doctoral level procrastinator. <laughs> I practically have a PhD in procrastination, but I probably would take too much time to spell PhD. But, you know, I mean, and so I would have these papers that would do. Yeah. And I, they needed to get typed. And this mm -hmm. was in high school. Well, who had the professional typist in the family? <laughs> this guy, you know. Yeah. And she really, you know, she just saved us so many times. Yeah. Um, and... This was not soft keyboard stuff. These were like, you know, but she was good. Wow. She had these old, um, I can't, I don't know if it was Olympus or maybe even older. Uh, but she would, she would type these papers for us. And wow. She was amazing in saving me that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, just to uh, check in, how, yeah. are, how are you doing? Uh, oh, oh, I see. Let yeah. me just... So just, um, you know, one other thing in terms of thinking about old style approaches to things. So I used to, um, you know, my mom tried these various things, these various ways to get my father um, sober. Yeah. Uh, just different strategies. And I don't know, there was an Alcoholics Anonymous thing at one point and, and a couple of different things. Um 
one of the things that we tried was uh, going to a to see a santero. Mm, sure, sure. To try essentially try to see if um, if there was something to the idea that like you know bad spirits uh, could be taken out of him. Yeah. Through the with the right ritual. Sure. I'm you know, I don't want to dismiss all of the thinking or the constructs that go into like why certain things are done yeah. in Santeria rituals. Sure. Um, so, because I, I, I just don't understand that stuff. Yeah. You know, I don't. Uh, and you know, obviously, it was present in our, all our neighborhoods. You yeah. know, there were botanicas that we pass by all the time. Absolutely. Uh, maybe I went into it once or twice as a kid. You know, but nothing. But um, yeah, and so this whole I remember sort of like being in a corner, thinking about this apartment and thinking of those old days. And being like in sort of a waiting area near the entrance, sitting down yeah. with a couple of chairs, and uh, and then just and and watching as down the hall in some other you know at this at the end of this hall is this room, and I see this woman sort of moving around, and she was dressed in white, yeah, um, a, you know a, a black Latina of some I'm assuming a Puerto Rican. Um, I think that's what I saw, and um, moving around and like you know blowing cigar smoke into sure, someone, sure, um, and and saying various things, and like I just I didn't know what this was, you know, yeah. and I was kind of I don't remember if I was a teen, a young teen, but it was uh, someone had suggested that that might be a way, and my mom was unfortunately always desperate. Yeah, for yeah, a solution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and try, you know, did everything she could for for him. Um, but I just thought this was kind of an interesting. It's like I I've known of people who have like tried to address like infidelity, sure, or uh, you know, terrible bad luck yeah. in their lives. Or, or coming to grips with a with someone who had you know they felt uh, had terrible designs on them right yeah. because those are different reasons like terrible plans or wishes for them against them they were trying to address like an enemy in their life sure but uh, I, I don't think I've heard any discussions about this stuff of like could you cure this guy's alcoholism? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, you know, he went through the procedure. I didn't see it. I was sort of, as I said, in the hallway. Uh, but something was done. And, uh, you know, for a while, this stuff, all of these various approaches had success, were met sure. with success. Uh, whether it was the AA or, or other things. Um you know, uh, but that was sort of an unusual approach. I don't know. My mom, as a practicing, believing Catholic, I don't know if this was something that she was, you know, this was something she really adhered to. She never practiced that in, at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she said, well, if it's in our culture, for some people it means something, and there's certainly enough places around here yeah. that practice it. And somebody suggested, somebody whom I know and trust suggested this. So she opened up to that, that part of our culture. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Which is sort of an interesting, like I don't remember that she would necessarily, for example, keep the altar around the, the apartment, you know, sure. or, or any of those things. Maybe, you know, crosses might go up on yeah. the wall, but I don't, I didn't quite see that. Yeah. So it's an interesting very interesting 
And you, you've talked now a, a, a couple of different instances of kind of, you know, the, what, what people's devotions or various kinds of devotions might look like behind, you know, say, closed doors in their homes. Yeah. But, and of course, of course, St. Anselm's itself, the Mass. But what about as far as like the neighborhood? Would any religious devotion take place in the neighborhood processions or maybe statues uh, uh, that would be outside or anything like that? I'm sure there, I'm sure there would be, but I just, I don't remember them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it would have been, it would have been initiated by St. Anselm. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, and there were, you know, certainly these, some of these societies would have that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would bet, I don't remember that, you know, now, uh, but I do, you know, I have seen them, noticed them in the last bunch of years. I'm still in the building where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, 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 um, Good Friday, a way of the cross procession might take place. You know. Sure. But um, I don't have that, you know, I don't have any connection now to the, to that parish. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that I would want it because I, I think they're really sort of, I think they're pre-Vatican. There's a lot of pre-Vatican too thinking there. Oh, okay. And, um, little, yeah, um, I don't mind if you've got the societies, you know, um, that they existed in the old age, in the, in the old days, but, um, I, I don't think that there's enough of a real interest in sort of people engagement. Absolutely. Lay person engagement. Yeah. I just this is sort of an outsider's observation. Um, they, the St. Anselm's, and all a lot of these other parishes have been uh, real beneficiaries of the great Mexican migrations into our neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mexicans primarily. There's also Hondureños. Sure. Um, and uh, and a little bit, you know, less uh, uh, Central American. I mean, to a lesser extent, Central Americans, but definitely the strong Mexican presence. And the other ones who have, you know, filled up the, those pews in large numbers. Yeah. In addition to the remaining, you know, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dominicans are probably also pretty strong too. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so. Sure. Yeah. Um, do you remember much talk around the neighborhood when you were growing up uh, of Puerto Rican independence? Were there many um, people that were talking about that in the neighborhood out in the open or... Not so much. I'm sure there was some. I mean, again, I, I, you know, my reference point, this guy, Jose Reyes. Yeah. Uh, who was uh, with the Young Lord's Party. Sure. He might have talked a little bit about it. just don't remember yeah 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 I don't remember being in conversations like that with anybody yeah um, yeah strong I think it was a strong sense of national pride sure absolutely uh, you know and a, a, you know somewhat nationalist pride it's an interesting thing because I, I this needs to be mentioned so not only were we in you know, in this area with the church yeah. playing this strong influence. But we were also in the land of Ramon Velez. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure that I would necessarily be the person to write the book. But I, I think I, whatever book writing ability I had, I left it on the, <laughs> all out there on, with, with this one book about Father Neil Conlon. Yeah. But although I did put some stuff there about Ramon Velez. The reason I mention that is because um, the Hunts Point Multi-Service Center, which was his main organization, yeah, a lot of federal funding because of his strong political connections. Sure. And it really played on Puerto Ricanness and Puerto Rican national identity. Yeah. I don't know what position he ever... I actually don't know if he took a position of being in favor of independence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was he certainly promoted the Puerto Rican national, you know, um, identity 
and celebration, a public celebration of the Puerto Rican identity. Sure. You know, I mean, he was a, a founder of the Puerto Rican Day Parade, mm -hmm. which was the big deal up until, which had been the big, the big deal prior to the parade was the big Puerto Rican deal in the city of New York. I think it could be argued well was the Fiesta San Juan Bautista. Mm. Now, that went up until, you know, that was going pretty well through the, through the 50s uh, as its own thing. Yeah. Uh, the parade first came into the picture, I think, in 58. Mm. We weren't in town until 61, and we certainly weren't in that neighborhood until, like, 62, 63. But, you know, the, the parade kept building up. Yeah. Um, and the Fiesta de San Juan Bautista, which would happen in, also in June, yeah. in the end of June, 25th, I think it was, of June. Um, um, we went, I think we went one time to Randall's Island for that. Fiesta de San Juan Bautista, mm. which was where, the, you know, it, be, it went to because it, it was such a large gathering. Yeah. Um, and then we went to Randall's Island afterward regularly as kids. We would go there for like family, or I mean as family, for like fa family picnics. There. Sure. Um, but in the meantime, setting up shop right there at Jackson Avenue, yeah. 152nd Street, and a few of the blocks around there was the Hunts Point Multi-Service Corporation and a couple of his other groups, the South Bronx uh, Community Corporation yeah. and the South Bronx Community Housing Corporation, all of his entities. Um, and also in the area, and, this, and there was a connection to my father in here, by the way, mm. also in this area was the South Bronx Democratic Club. Ah, sure. And that was his. Oh, yeah, yeah. I okay. mean, he controlled that. Um, and my cousin, for a short while, she was a trained, licensed social worker. And she got this job to be a social worker for, I think, the like, uh, substance abuse treatment program, primarily focusing on alcoholics yeah. at the Huntsman Multi Service Center. And sure enough, true to form, uh, I think she met with him directly, and she was told, I mean, I think all employees met with him. Yeah. And she was, uh, you know, the subject of loyalty was expressed to her. <laughs> and then she was told on a number of different occasions by the staff that she was expected to participate in certain events mm. that the center was carrying out. Uh, but it extended also into like certain political events. Ah, okay, okay. So people who were employees were essentially political volunteers as well. Yeah. Were expected to be political volunteers. She didn't last that long. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember if she just said, no, nah, this is not going to be the place for me. Yeah. But, um, and so that was down the block. On Jackson Avenue was, you'll see this large structure. Hunts Point Multi Service Center. It's called the Ramon S. Velez Community Health or Community Center. Uh, and the block, 152nd Street, every year, the Saturday before the parade, <coughs> or two Saturdays before the Sunday of the parade, yeah. would be this big festival. The street fair would be blocked off. And all of these vendors and this music with these two stages playing at the end. It's a long block yeah, yeah. and a lot of music. And uh, so his presence was felt there. And when I, when mom was taking me, if I needed like uh, to go to the eye doctor, most of the time when we went down to the, the, uh, the eye, Manhattan Eye, Ear, Nose and Throat Center mm. in the 60s, I had a lot of eye problems, still do. With, sure. Uh, grew up wearing patches. <laughs> But, you know, that's the way it was. Yeah, um, yeah. And, but, she, uh, you know, a couple of times, I think maybe particularly with dental stuff, there was a clinic on Caldwell Avenue. Mm. And that was run also.
by the Hunts Point Mall Police Service. Wow. <laughs> and so there were these, yeah, this guy knew how to sort of, you know, establish himself. Going back to my father and to this club. So my father told, this was on Southern Boulevard. Mm. Around the corner from Prospect on 149th Street is Southern Boulevard, the beginning of it, or the sort of more continuation of it. Yeah. The major beginning of it. And, and that's where the South Bronx Democratic Club was. Mm. And my father would tell me, go over there. They've got jobs. You know, that's where you can get jobs. Sure. So I would go over there. And, you know, I did not know until later, and my brother Peter explained this to me a little bit more, that these folks grew up, some of these folks who were connected to Velez yeah. grew up with my father. Oh, in the wow. old country. Wow. And they stayed as friends. And they knew that my father was a professional. Yeah. You know, my father never worked for them. But they knew that he was a professional. And they would always sort of exchange. Notes, oh, this, oh, I've got my sons and they're bright. And, well, well, listen, have your sons come on over. And, you know. Uh, and, and, and he says, you know, if you know anybody looking for a job, send them over our way. And so there was like a, a job center, I think, that one part of this building. Yeah. And I think the South Bronx Democratic Club was another part of this building. Okay, wow. Um, and and yeah, I think I may have gotten that. I may have gotten one or a couple of my summer jobs by going to that place. Yeah, yeah. You know, they had. I mean, they had formal employees with contracts with the city. Sure. To provide employment for kids. Uh, and my brother expressed to me. He said he told me this story. He says, he says this connection, you know, between these guys. Especially this guy Federico Perez, mm. who was like a right, one of one of Bella's right hand people. He says, "When I got out of law school, yeah. the day that I got out of law school, I got a call from Federico Perez. He says, Pedro, I heard you graduated. Come work for us." Wow. <laughs> this was the sort of tentacles in every corner approach yeah. that Bella's took. To trying to capture all of the all of the talent that he could. Yeah, my brother didn't want any part of it. You know, yeah. we had spent our time organizing in the South Bronx, and we knew that one of the people getting in the way of the people being able to demand change sure. was fellas. Yeah, that's the way we saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, and it was just sort of it's too much sort of corruption, and you you know very much uh, like Trump, the transactional guy. Definitely. What's in it for me? Definitely. Uh, and he also made clear that opponents, he, he would brook no no opposition. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Eviscerate them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, and all of these housing complexes that he helped, you know, get funding for and helped get set up, they all had names, and they were all people that he, you know, he put those names there. Yeah. They were all people who had been good to him, who had been loyal to him. Yeah. You know, the one thing missing from the Trump uh, game, the Trump approach methodology is he wasn't giving enough praise to all the people who had been loyal to him by rewarding them, by putting, slapping their name on some of the, these other buildings. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah. maybe that's a business strategy. The branding gets lost, but the but Bella's new to reward people. Yeah, for sure. Um, but anyway, that, that was the whole point of, of saying that he would express, you know, and you could sense in all this area around here that this was the guy, and he was the symbol of the defender of the Puerto Ricans. Mm, I see, That's I a way, see, yeah. long way of answering that, that question, but he sure. was very much a presence. And when sure. you get out of the train in Jackson Avenue, and you look at the street sign, it's, you know, it says 152nd Street, but because that had been used so long, and still gets used for that uh, Puerto Rican Day street festival, Yeah. Uh, it's called Dr. Ramon S. Velez Boulevard or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's wow. the influence he had. Wow, wow. And many of the elected officials, you know, knew that they couldn't cross him. Yeah. Even the, what I thought was very good for a good while, Congressman Jose Serrano. Sure, sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, that was sort of the, that was the version of Puerto Rican nationalism. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But not not discussions. I don't remember hearing discussions about Puerto Rican independence or engaging in them. Sure, sure. I mean, I guess uh, the young lords uh, were kind of the locus of that during the short time that that they were in existence. Um, but yeah. And they had to have been around. Yeah. As I said, Jose Reyes said he was a member of theirs. Um, um, and I do know that briefly they approached Neil Connolly when he was at St. Athanasius mm. about doing something. Yeah. Um, so right around 1970. Yeah, right yeah. Around 69, 70. Uh, yeah. And I would have just been graduating from elementary school. 